I, I want to clarify, um, and, and I, I'm glad that somebody brought this up because I didn't have the Greek text in front of me when I was talking about Matthew 5.19 and the term, I said pereo was used there, but it's not. It is poieo. I want to clarify that because I was wrong. And, um, and I view it, it this way, that Christ's ministry to Israel, to the Jews, was different than Paul's ministry to the Gentiles and John's ministry to the Gentiles. Every time that the law is used for how we are to handle or what we are we to do with the law... In the New Testament, in Paul's and John's epistles, tereo is used. And tereo is to keep, to guard. Why? Because that's our heart. The law is written in our heart. It wasn't written in the heart of the Jews. It was written on stones. And and Jesus was saying there that, that, that they were going to need to do the law not just in physicalness, in the body, but they were to do the law in the soul. In other words, if I, if I had lusted after a woman, I have committed adultery with her in my heart so that no one, no Jew that was there could say, I have done the law. And so his was an evangelistic approach. The law was still the tutor there. And so the poieo must be understood. Otherwise, if the poi, if the tereo is too soon, then it doesn't get you to Christ. But that will come because Christ is going to be killed He is going to be crucified. He's yet to be crucified here in Matthew 5. That's my explanation of it. I am sorry to to having misrepresented that word because I I know the rest of the epistles, John, and and you will look and and I will be right on that one. That John and Paul always said tereo, in regard to the law. Yes? There's always satisfaction in doing a good job. With the Absolutely. I, I, I'm in, uh, uh, in the state of Washington and there's a sign that says click it or tick it. Uh-huh. And I don't wear my seatbelt, but I've started wearing it since <laughs> I've been here. I feel so good that I'm obeying. And yes. That there's satisfaction in doing that. Well, who wants to be a lawbreaker? You know, Paul himself said in Romans 7, he said, what? I do the very thing I hate. It's no longer I that does it, but sin that indwells me. Yeah. And, and so, Paul, by the way, don't let anybody tell you that Paul meant in regard to his former life there. <laughs> These are present active, indicative verbs. In other words, they're present in that it is now. As Paul was writing that, he says, I sin. I do the very thing I hate. Paul, Paul, what are you saying? He says, I'm the chief of sinners. He wasn't just talking about his former life. Not just his former life, but now. I do the very thing I I hate, it's no longer I that does it, but sin that indwells me. The other part of that is it's indicative. In other words, it's truth. No one will debate that. That is an undebatable thing. It is not optional. It's not subjective. It's not, it is not something that isn't true. And everybody just, okay, there's no question asked because Paul said this to be empirical. So, those two elements are in those verbs. Paul says, I do now, I perform, I practice, I do the very thing I hate. 
It's no longer I that does it, but sin that indwells me. In fact, he goes on. And, and this will bring us back into, into Timothy very well. Indeed, he says, well, what can I say? Well, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Who will set me free from the body of this death? By the way, that term, body of death, is a, is a Roman judgment. And the one who aggravatedly killed somebody, the body was tied, chained to him until his own body started to decay and he would die. And he would, would die by just a disgustingly, gruel, gruesome means he would be attached to this dead body that he killed until he, it consumed him. That is the reference that Paul is using to the body of death. And it says, who will set me free from the body of this death? And you know, it, it, it's funny, it, it's funny because Paul is up above, he is saying, well, my body is this way. I, I still sin. I do the very thing I hate. It's no longer I that does it, but sin that indwells me. Who will set me free? He says, there is now no condemnation. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I'm still attached to the body of death, but there is no condemnation. In other words, it's not going to kill me. Why? Because I won't die. That is not going to kill me. There is no condemnation. Even though I drag around this body, there's no condemnation. It's not going to kill me. I'm going to survive it. And you know, that's, that is exactly what Paul, his reference to Timothy becomes. Because we're talking about a church that is not an Elks Club. We're talking about a church like uh, C.H. Spurgeon understood church. Somebody said to C.H. Spurgeon, well, gee, uh, Charles, tell me, where's the perfect church? And he said to them, he said, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. And Ephesus was no different. It was not the perfect church. But Paul is setting up something that will enable it to survive the body of death. Because it's still in the flesh. You've still got the flesh. You will not have that hounding you until you have received your glorified body in the resurrection. That's the rest. That is the finish product of our salvation. So that when we are saved, we are saved in spirit, in soul, sanctification, in, in spirit, justification, in soul, sanctification, in body, glorification. And that is completely in opposition to the Gnostic understanding of salvation. And by the way, the Methodists are getting there. They don't believe in a bodily resurrection. Many of them don't. And they're teaching it out in, in, certain, in certain fields, in certain mission fields. Uh, they're, they're trying to teach that in Tonga. Uh, that's where uh, faith, faith uh, we are uh, uh, very much a part of that uh, uh, ministry in Tonga. And the Methodism has, uh, has uh, really come into play there and, and uh, trying to do something there that, that would dismantle that ministry. <clears throat> oh, if... Uh, Charles West, or excuse me, John Wesley only knew. (coughs) 
Okay, we uh, head back to First uh, Timothy. <clears throat> By the way, if you you get kind of a picture here that there's an awful lot to preach and teach on in in the pastorals, and I think that we kind of scoot by them too often. I think that we, uh, we uh, move on ahead and, and, and scoot by them and we, we kind of concentrate on, on maybe the Gospels and, and uh, maybe some other epistles and try to stay away from Timothy and Second Timothy and Titus. And I... Hey, we're dealing with the full counsel of God. We're dealing with the whole counsel of God. That's one of the reasons why uh, uh, Martin Luther set up uh, the, the yearly, actually it was a tri-yearly, essentially a pastor, every pulpit in the Lutheran church will go through the entirety of Scripture in three years. It's time to wake up. <laughs> okay so wanting to be teachers of the law even though they do not understand either what they are saying but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully realizing the fact that the law is made for the righteous man but for those, or excuse me, is not made for the righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious. Now, understanding this, that what does Paul say about the righteous man? And go ahead and speak up. What does Paul say about the righteous man? He lives by faith, exactly. He lives by faith and not by works of the law. So, that the law wasn't made for the righteous man... It wasn't made, it was to get the sinner, the vile, the, the thief, the one who is in need, to the physician. It was to bring that one to Christ. So that then, now, he doesn't need the law. But, he still does have derived some great benefits from the law. And the curses of the Old Testament are still intact. But if you look at those curses between Moses and Israel in Ebal and Gerizim, you'll see this, that Moses will state the law and say, if you do this, if you disobey this law, then the Lord will do this to you physically. And so there were blessings and there were cursings. Cursings if you didn't, blessings if you did. And it was all toward the physical well-being of the nation of Israel. So that the doing of the law in Israel was to keep Israel intact. Why would God want to keep Israel intact? God would want to keep Israel intact so that he has a lineage in which he will come and fulfill the law. So by their doing the law, they're allowing and helping to fulfill the law. Yes? Uh, I'm I'm in uh, in verse 8. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing, nine, the fact that the law was not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers. That was why the law was made. And that the fulfillment of that is to bring those murderers, bring those sinners of which all mankind was 
to salvation through Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the law. <clears throat> for the immoral men, for the homosexual, the kidnappers, the liars, the perjurers, and the list goes on, and whatever else, and whatever else. You know, if I miss something there, I'll get it with this one. And for whatever else is contrary. Oh, did I leave anybody out? <laughs> no. No one is left out. I thank Christ, Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement. And I think that this is really watered down because it's using, again, hopistos ho logos. Faithful is the word. Because logos, to the Greek, would not be just a statement. It's just not... It, it's, it just is not how the Greek would think. He might say something else. He might use another word. But he wouldn't use logos just as a statement of passing. Because logos was reserved, remember, for Sophia. <laughs> By the way, that's, that's another thing about the Greek is um, prophetes is a is a feminine gender noun, which is prophet. It's a feminine gender noun. And Sophia, in the, in the classical writings, sent women prophets, actually two or three, I think it was, to give logos, or to be the initiators of logos. And that is why that is feminine. And not being anywhere else found in the world at propetos, which would be the masculine, propetes was used in the New Testament. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that wasn't legitimate. Because there were several prophetesses, you find the you find in there, you find in there uh, in the scripture in Acts about the the daughters of Philip being prophetesses, and Agabus is a prophetess, and so is each daughter of Philip a prophetess. That's not a, a Berkeley uh, background, by the way. So don't worry about whether uh, I'm becoming a feminist or not. <laughs> and yet for this reason I found mercy in order that in me as the foremost, as the foremost what? Sinner. It is a trustworthy statement. It is, the word is faithful. Deserving full acceptance. Not just a glib statement. The word is faithful. Deserving full acceptance. Have you noticed something about what is, is occurring here? I'm right out of the NASB. 
That's how much I feel about this translation. That I can rely on this translation. Now, I'll tell you where, where I will... I'll see some other things or see some, some more full things from the NASB. But it is very, very good. It is very, very good. And, and it'll keep you on track. And yet, for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience in me, the foremost. Jesus might demonstrate His perfect patience. That, that Paul himself became an example of Christ's patience. Remember when he first was saved, when he was going to Damascus, and I believe this was Ananias, wasn't it? Ananias was told in the Spirit to go and to, the, uh, to the road of straight and to uh, go to this certain house and, and Saul will be there. And he goes, whoa! <laughs> oh man, this guy's got some letters in his hand. And we are in hiding, Lord. And this man is going to kill us. And you're telling me to go up there and put my neck in a noose. And God says he is a called servant of mine to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And he says, well, wait a minute, but he did all of this to the church, so aren't you going to get him? <laughs> you know, you've got him now, get him. <laughs> but he says, I will show Paul what he must suffer for my name's sake. So, there was a twofold ministry that Paul has in his, in his apostleship. It was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to set up churches everywhere, to make disciples, and it was to suffer for the name of Christ. He was called specifically, and he told Ananias, you don't worry about that. You're not called to suffer specifically like Paul is called to suffer specifically. Now, Paul goes on to say, he says, he says that, that his suffer, it, it was like he was, and, and he almost uses a simile here, it was like his own sufferings was to take up the slack from where Jesus left off. And I'm paraphrasing, and it's terrible to paraphrase. It's the living Bible according to Jay Thompson. But, he said, but that is such a curious statement. But in this, I am understanding, in his call, and in that statement to Ananias, I understand exactly what Paul was referring to. Paul did understand that he was also called to suffer. That he was going to be stoned. That he was going to be kicked. That he was going to be beaten. That he was going to be left for dead. That he was going to be uh, grabbed by the Jews and, and given to the Gentiles. That he would have people wanting to kill him wherever he went. Now, I remember when I was in college... And I was a very, it was very early in my Christianity. And there was a, a group that would tour up the campuses. And one of them's name was Holy Hubie. And Holy Hubie was a street preacher who'd stand up in the middle of, of uh, the square around the students. And we had at uh, Western Washington State College, it was college at the time, it was a it was a found fountain, and he would stand up there and and preach to all those students, and uh, invariably somebody would come and either push him in the in the fountain, and he'd plunge into the water, 
or slap him or do something to him. And, you know, on, and the campus security didn't care whether, you know, somebody biffed him or bopped him or whatever. Um, but, you know, the idea for the student population was to make him a laughing stock. And, and this guy just kept right on preaching. He'd get up. He, he, he himself was just soaking wet. His Bible was soaking wet, and he'd open up right from where he stopped, and he'd just continue on. And Paul was even much more. Now, I, I'm glad I don't have a, a, the ministry of Holy Hubie, but I almost fell into a trap once. And that was, uh, we were down in Oregon, and I was a, 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 an associate pastor of a church down there, and I had some youth with me, and we were at the, at the festival down in, in Oregon, and Holy Hubie was there. And he was preaching like, he was preaching hellfire and brimstone. But it, that's exactly what he needed to preach to that population. And one of my, uh, one of my uh, uh, young youth people in the group said to me, is this a legitimate ministry? And I was just about ready to say something, and a guy turned around right in front of me. And, just, and I'm glad I didn't say anything, because he, he opened up his mouth and he says, is this guy legitimate? He says, if it hadn't been for the Word of God that what came out of the mouth of this man 15 years ago, I would not be saved today. And so I was glad I didn't step into that one. <laughs> because I could have said, well, it's pretty harsh. <laughs> it's pretty harsh. But you know something, death is harsh. And Paul knew that death is harsh. And he states that death is harsh. But he is the sole provider received by God the word of the Lord to give to the Gentiles. He is our Holy Hubie. Holy Hubie would not be saved yet because God sent, Christ sent the Apostle Paul. How shall they hear? Or excuse me, how shall they believe? Unless somebody is sent. How shall they hear? Unless there is a preacher. <clears throat> For faith comes through hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ. Without the Word, faith doesn't come. Now, I want you to know this. Election does come. God's choice does come. But what is faith? Faith is so that we may know who we belong to. The term there is found in 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 1 Titus. I'm sorry, Titus. Titus 1. <clears throat> Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is a, in accordance or is according to godliness. Titus 1.1. 1, 1. And Paul says there that his apostleship, and this is very much a part of what he is disseminating both to Timothy and to Titus, his apostleship of Christ Jesus. And by the way, the New American Standard is a little bit off here because it should be translated 
not for the faith, but in accordance to the faith, or according to the faith, or on account of the faith. In other words, it's a two it's a two street proposition. In other words, Paul has no apostleship except for the faith of the elect. Without the faith of the elect, Paul has no apostleship. And vice versa. Without the apostleship of Paul, there is no faith for the elect. Oh my! You see, it's not for the faith. It's not the apostleship just going one direction. It's going both directions. Why? Because in it, the elect are called. The eclectos. What is that? Jesus said in, in, uh, in uh, John 10, He says, I am the good shepherd of the, fee, uh, of the sheep. I know my sheep. And my sheep, what? Know me. And I call them out by what? By name. I call them out by name. Each individual. I, I had a rare opportunity when I was uh, in seminary to be looking at uh, a piece of property for a, a church that, uh, that uh, we were wanting to build. And it, was, it happened to be on a, on a, a pasture land for sheep. And we, we decided to do the Old Testament thing and walk the perimeter of the land and claim it in the name of God. Well, that's weird, isn't it? By the way, our claims didn't, didn't hold. <laughs> so, you know, anyway. Um, and, but there were sheep, and there was a shepherd there. In fact, the owner of that pasture was the shepherd. And I, and I was talking to this shepherd, and I said, tell me, are these things so? He says, I'll show you they're so. And he started, and, and he had the fold of the sheep. It was kind of a gated area, uh, and, and, the, and the gate was open, but all the sheep were in there. And he started by calling each sheep out. Now, the, the, the purpose is to shear the sheep. You know, you're not going to keep sheep just because they're cute and fuzzy. But that wool is very, very valuable. So what do you call them out for? To be shorn? And other reasons. Anyway, so he starts calling name by name. And each sheep responded directly to their name. And came out when he called. Until all of those sheep were out. And then he says, but wait, there's more. Here's all their names. And he started rattling off some names. So I got about, you know, five or six of them. And he puts them back in the fold. And I start calling. And they didn't come. They didn't hear my voice. Because I was not the shepherd. You see, Jesus went on and said... My sheep hear my voice. A, another voice they will not hear. That is this term chosen. Elect is not something to be afraid of. Because without election, we would not be called out. That's nothing to be fearful for. It's not going to harm your psyche, even if the Hellenists say it will. It's not going to harm your psyche. It actually goes on from there. He put me in the gate, and he had his sheep out, and he starts calling them. From, the, from inside the full. And they start running toward him. And they almost ran me right over. I was not an obstacle to them as long as they were going to the shepherd. 
I would have died had I not jumped out of the way. There was a stampede headed my way because they had heard the shepherd's voice and they were going to the shepherd. That is a very great illustration of our call. And according to Paul, here in Titus, that his ministry was on account of the elect, the faith of the elect. Those who were chosen. Now, by the way, this term, eclectos, well, I'll get into that later. I'll get into that later. Let's, let's stop there. You'll come back now, won't you? <laughs> we'll get into that later. We want to continue here. We're going to we're going to jump ahead here uh, in uh, in chapter one of uh, of First Timothy, and you know we're going to I'll tell you we'll just do what we need to do and and wherever we are at the end. That's that's good. If we don't if we don't get into in into the entirety of the pastorals, you're going to get a very nice flavor for what's going on in all of these. Verse eighteen. And, and I, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't, without reading verse 17, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a great, great, great benediction. And it's in response to what? His former manner of life. So, in other words, this. He was understanding something about even that James said. Oh, forbid. <laughs> you know, I, I do love Paul because he doesn't uh, cut any mustard with James. And, and, uh, but he, was, he understood something that James said, and James was right on the money. He said, the one who is, who is doubting, he is like... The one without an anchor and just tossed and thrown by every wind of doctrine. And he says, and the one who is this certain way, he is like a man. And, and help me out uh, with the context a little bit. He is like a man that once he has looked in the mirror and once he has looked in the mirror and walks away, he has forgotten, forgotten what he has seen. His own image. Now, Paul re- referenced that a little bit in Corinthians when he talks about being seeing in a mirror dimly. That term is mirror. It's great translation. In a mirror dimly. In other words, um, when I look at the counsel of God, I am looking, it is looking into myself. And what I see is myself. And if I walk away from that counsel of God, I walk away from the image that I have seen. And I forget what I have been forgiven from. And then, the notion that I have a Savior is diminished. And my faith starts to wane. And I start to doubt. So that if I walk away from Christ's Word, from the Word of God, it is no longer reflecting back on my soul, my mind, will, and emotions. And it is certainly not cleaning them And I am forgetting what I was freed from. And I am forgetting what Christ has forgiven me of. I use this, by the way, as a great commitment giver. 
for people to dedicate five minutes a day to Scripture. And start low. Start low. Five minutes a day becomes ten minutes a day, becomes fifteen minutes a day, becomes twenty minutes a day, becomes a half hour a day. And you'll see some growth in your churches. You'll see some spiritual renewal that you have never seen in your life, in your churches. You get them into the Word. So now unto the King Eternal, and I and I love this because what this mirror image does for us is this. It brings us to worship. Now to the King Eternal. Invisible. Immortal. The only God. The honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. By the way, uh, this, this term forever and ever... Is is a I own uh, let's see I I only own or I only no excuse me I own use I own use um, it is plural and uh, and it's ages of ages ages of ages in other words it doesn't have a beginning and it does not have an end what that is is eternal. We are not eternal, by the way, and every reference to man is not Ionios or Ionius, Ionius. It is Ionios or Ionion, Ionion. Singular. Age of age. And that means this that it had a beginning, but it has no end. So, in other words, there's two terms there there's eternal or eternity and everlasting. And man is everlasting and God is eternal. Man is everlasting, God is eternal. Man is on the singular side of the age. God is on the plural side of the ages. So understand that in Scripture because it will be throughout. This command... I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you. There was something else going on there, wasn't there? There was something else going on there. That by them you might fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Oh, this is a real question. What does he mean here? He goes on, he says, Among them is Hermineus and Alexander, whom I have delivered over to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. Well, is Paul getting out of hand? <clears throat> Well, I find it very interesting that Paul uses the term for shipwreck here. He uses that as a, as a, a, a metaphor, actually. Uh-uh. A simile. He's not likening it to it. He's using it as a... As... Anyway, and he is, his, his reference is to his own experience. And I also find it interesting in Acts... 27, we have what is the only account of a Pauline shipwreck. Even though Paul had two or three, there's one account of a Pauline shipwreck here. And let's take a look at that. And I believe that this is the account that Paul is referencing in regard to the term shipwreck in regard to Alexander and Hermineus' faith. And we look at the chapter 27, and, and we'll all start...
At, and I'll, and I'll, I'll start with verse 22. And it's Paul stood up, verse 21, in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. He says, Yet, now I urge you to keep up your courage for there shall be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Wow. And going on to verse 30... Luke records, he says, as the sailors were trying, there were some sailors who were trying to escape from the ship. And he says, as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion to the, and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship... You yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes and the ship's boat and it let it fall away. And then in verse 34, Therefore I encourage you to take food, for this is your preservation. For not a hair from the head of any of you shall perish. Now, I believe that that is the illustration for that word regarding Alexander. Even though their body, and Paul says, I have delivered them over to Satan, and it may be that Satan had at their flesh. They were excommunicated from the church no longer the Word corporately would protect them from the onslaughts of Satan. But they would be taught not to blaspheme. But they would not lose their life. Their life shall be saved. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 10 and on. Paul writes, According to the grace of God which was given to me, a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And another is building upon it, but each, let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laying, which is what? Christ Jesus. This is a direct tie-in to Hebrews six, where it says that where it says that 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 they can't be renewed to repentance. Why? Because they're already on the foundation of repentance. You cannot renew a foundation. You cannot remake, rebuild a foundation. They're already there. You do not build two foundations for one home. It's impossible to do that. Absolutely impossible. So Paul continues, For no man can lay the foundation, a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation... Hey, Todd, would you check that time? All right, great. For, uh, let's see. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. Go back to Hebrews 6 again and say... 
and, sh- and you can see what has, is taking place in regard to crops. He says the, the field, the ground. The ground is useful for the one who is cultivating it. And if the ground yields thistles and thorns, it is close to useless and it is what burned. Well, any farmer will tell you he doesn't burn the ground. It's not the ground that's burned. It is the thistles and the thorns. So that that ground can be prepared so that it can produce good crops. Now, let's keep, keep on going here. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because what? It is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. So, Alexander and Hermines' salvation is not the issue here. What's at issue is their body. Can the Lord burn the ground and can they can that ground produce good fruit or should it just be taken and there would be no ministry now that is the very picture of, of in a sense of Christ saying to the church in Ephesus if you do not return to your first love I will remove your Witness, I will remove your lampstand out of its place. In other words, you who have no witness. Why? Because you don't love. You don't have love, you don't have witness. You don't have a testimony. You don't have a ministry. So it is much more in regard to what is taking place in regard to works than... And those works are what? Those works that receive reward and remain are what? Out of agape. Nothing else. Out of agape. And they, because they are out of agape, they are the works of Christ. And those remain. This next section, I will take a little time, and I I don't have enough time on this uh, DVD. So I'm going to uh, just uh, move a little bit ahead, and then we'll come back to it uh, on on the third session. And I want to, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just make mention uh, on, on verse 5. For there is one God in, in chapter 2. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, that is bracketed. And I want to bracket this. I want to introduce this next section in, in chapter 2. Notice the context. There's a context there, isn't there? First of all, proto, firstly, primarily, primarily, I urge that in entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on what? Behalf of all men. This is a general term. It's like all mankind. It's a general term. It's not individual. It's a general term. All mankind. For then he then he specifies. He makes some specifications for kings and all who are in authority 
in order that what? And this is causal, by the way. This is causal. This is a purpose. This is a purpose clause that we may lead a... That we, the Christians, may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is, this is the, the, should I say, the context of what he is going to say next. And it must be understood as the context. Because if you start grabbing the next passage all by itself, it makes no sense at all. It just is absolutely out of context. And if you use this for what I think you're going to use it for, the next, you're wrong. And I'll guarantee you're wrong. 